as you're taking your Bibles and turning to those two passages of Scripture that we read a few moments ago, 2 Kings 18 and 2 Kings 19, uh, I want to mention just a few things uh, which are really very wonderful and exciting. Uh, I, I know that some of you were here this past week, especially the ladies who were helping out uh, with all the marvelous meals that we had. And ladies, I thank you very much for doing that, all the hard work that you put into it, all the cooking and uh, all the planning and everything else that went into making sure that there were meals and refreshments at the break times and uh, being friendly to our guests and just basically meeting their needs, taking care of them. So thank you all ladies very much. And they graciously, the ACCC, graciously left for us a number of pieces of literature that I'd like to mention uh, on the table in the back as you go through and you look at the wall that is facing us here in the auditorium, you'll find books. They are free. The Bible Doctrine of Separation. This is a white paper by the American Council of Christian Churches. You will find some free DVDs. Here I stand, and even has Dr. McIntyre in here, and there's the picture of him saying goodbye uh, from the church down the street here. And uh, you'll find uh, Dr. McIntyre and all sorts of uh, other people that are fundamentalists in our history. Here I stand, a documentary film about separation and ecumenism. Ecumenism. I also get it right. Also, please vote. Please vote. People, our freedom depends on it. It really does. I'll be saying more about that a little bit later on. There are brochures like this that tell you all the different messages and breakout sessions. There were some incredible breakout sessions that you might be interested in. Uh, Brad Zell gave one on the International Council of Christian Churches. The ACCC and the ICCC have been at odds with each other for 50 years. Uh, bizarre. They're all fundamentalists. We need to get together as fundamentalists. I'm so glad that the ACCC, even though it had a rift 50 years ago with this church, uh, is back and we're back with them. There were sex, uh, some on same-sex attra attraction and lesbian gay, bisexual, transgender agenda in society and evangelicalism. There are those who are call themselves evangelicals who say that's okay. Uh, separation of disobedient brethren. Practical considerations for biblical conservative worship. Homosexuality, transgenderism, praying in Jesus' name, contemporary issues for chaplains and Christians. That was an excellent session. That's one of the sessions that I attended. You can get a list of those and then you can access them in one week on the ACCC website. So I hope you will do that. There's also a notebook like this. Very nice, glossy cover, and many things about the ACCC in it and where it's going to be next spring and where it's going to be next fall. Hope some of you can attend. And then some biographical information about the speakers. There, of course, are brochures about the American Council of Christian Churches, if you don't know anything about it. But the thing that I think is so neat and interesting are all of the white papers and uh, resolutions that they have passed which are printed and you can get copies they're on the table in the back statement on the death of Billy Graham the God of sports how our culture is beginning to worship sports the multi-denominational heritage of biblical fundamentalism here's one Pope Francis's encyclical on climate change Laudato Si <laughs> what's the poop, Pope sorry about that uh, got to do with climate change Recent ecumenism in Roman Catholicism, same-sex attraction, marriage and sexual morality, the Supreme Court's decision mandating same-sex marriage, transgenderism, evangelicalism in Martin Luther King Jr., racism, godly Christian living in evil times, together for the gospel, the Assembly of the Believers, you see there are quite a few. How glad I am they've taken a stand on the next one. Young Earth Creationism, the New Calvinism, Freedom and Respect for Civil Authority, the Theological Danger of Non-Cessationism, that is, the people who say, oh, tongues are still around and healings and miracles are still around. What is the danger of that? The Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification, and of course, earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So be sure to make your way to the lobby after the service today and uh, pick up a copy 
of the ones that are of interest to you, and I hope that some of them are, because that's where we stand on these issues, folks. It's very important. So the past week, we had the privilege, of course, of hosting the annual meeting of the American Council of Christian Churches, and I was delighted to see a very large contingent of ministers from Faith Presbytery were also present. Although, of course, I was somewhat saddened to see that none of the members of Synod, from which we broke away, were present to declare their support of fundamentalism in the United States. But the men of Faith Presbytery were here to represent what this church in Collingswood has taken as its historic stand for the inerrant, authoritative, infallible, plenary inspiration of the Word of God in the face of encroaching compromise and apostasy in the so-called church around the world today. All the messages of the conference centered on the faithful preacher of the gospel. That's what characterized the Protestant Reformation, which began 501 years ago, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg, Germany. The speakers were outstanding and shared an incredible harvest of new insights as we look back on that movement that ultimately gave us back the Bible in our native languages so that preachers could indeed preach the gospel to the people. The faithful gospel preacher. That's the heart of the Reformation. The Bible and faithful men preaching it. The return to the scriptures to the people a turn of the scriptures to the people in their own languages as the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. The Bible is the sort of the spirit that cuts through the morass of the gooey slime that builds up when men add their own ideas and philosophies to the trash piles of human history and with a clothespin holding their noses, drag us through their rotting garbage and tell us to eat for they claim this is food good for the soul. That's not what the faithful preacher of the gospel does. Rome had gathered sewage for hundreds of years and was force feeding it to the spiritually enslaved masses when suddenly, with blinding light from heaven, one man was awakened by the word of God. The just shall live by faith. But what does that have to do with the Old Testament passages that we've just read? What does Hezekiah and the huge list of Old Testament and New Testament saints have to do with the Protestant Reformation? We can start to answer that question by noticing a certain repeated pattern that's found many times in Scripture and illustrated by those two brief partial chapters that I read. And <laughs> if you want to read more, just read more about the kings of Israel. In a nutshell, what are the key differences between the kings of the Old Testament? The answer is, on one side, there were carnal, pleasure-seeking, willful rebellion against the word of God and refusing to believe, and as a result, refusing to obey. On the other side, as you look at the kings of Israel, and we looked at one of the good ones just a moment ago with Hezekiah, there was faith and sacrifice. There was obedience to the word of God in spite of external threats of death. That's precisely the contrast between all the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 and the rest of the world that surrounded them. But there's more than that. There's also a progression as we see the ancestors of Hezekiah and as we see kings that came after him. There's a progression. There are some good and wise kings like King Solomon. Solomon was the son of David Bathsheba, by Bathsheba, the granddaughter of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was David's wisest counselor. We're told that when he spoke, it was like the speaking to an oracle of God himself. David was no slouch either when it came to wisdom. God used David to write most of the Psalms. And Solomon is declared to be the wisest man in the Old Testament. God used him to write the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. Three whole books of the Bible were written by just two men as well as other historical books listing many of their words and deeds, we find more about them. But we also see that there were some problems that began to infect later generations, and that's what I want us to understand today as we look at our current culture and the desperate need for another Reformation. Both had problems, both David and Solomon, had problems with sex sins. 
But when we get to Solomon, the sex sins led him to another kind of compromise. It's just a step on the downhill slope. He married the daughter of Pharaoh, who brought her pagan religion with her to Jerusalem. Solomon using marriage in a way that God never intended as a political power play. Does that sound familiar to you? He made an affinity with the king of Egypt. If war was looming, Pharaoh would not attack Solomon because Solomon had Pharaoh's daughter. It would be like a nasty little hostage situation. In reading 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, we discover many other compromises of this sort with all of David's wives and all of Solomon's wives and concubines, totaling a thousand women. That was not exactly God's plan for marriage. But what David had started by breaking the divine norm for marriage, Solomon took to excess and ended up polluting the worship of God. That is precisely what is happening wholesale today with sodomite so-called marriages and other perversions that are now recognized in the civil realm and the legal realm of our country. 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many women, many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Z Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn your heart away after the, their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord. Get that word fully. Because that's the situation of the church today. Well, they go after the Lord their God, but not fully. And that's why we see what's happening in society around us today. Went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build in high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which were incest and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. Do you think he will be any less angry with us? Because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Oh, people, there's a lot of application there for us. We'll get to it. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. What's astonishing about all this is the fact that God personally appeared to Solomon and asked what Solomon wanted, and Solomon asked for wisdom. And God didn't say, well, that's too hard. I'm not going to give that to you. God gave him wisdom. In other words, Solomon did not fall into these sins for lack of wisdom. He let his flesh take control. He entered into the sins knowingly, and he entered into the sins with his eyes wide open. As a result, this is how David's kingdom ended in the divided kingdom, with the ten northern tribes splitting away from the descendants of David 
and only Judah and Benjamin remaining within the Davidic line. And as time progressed, we saw that both Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, that was the southern kingdom, multiplied the sins that were started by Solomon. The sins of one person are not confined to that one person, especially a person who's in any kind of position of leadership in any of the four spheres of authority that God has given. Solomon probably thought that it was just a little compromise, but it ended with the people of God being thoroughly polluted with paganism and witchcraft. And that's what happened in the early history of the church. And that's why the Protestant Reformation, beginning in 1517, had to get out. Come out and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is the repetitive history of God's people, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament or during this church age where we see the church rotting and the church rotting until there is so much corruption. Finally, God brings out a few people and then it begins to rot and rot and corrupt and corrupt and then God has to reach down and bring out a few more people. Dear people, which group do you want to be in? Do you not understand that the Protestant Reformation is one of the most magnificent illustrations of this principle in all of history? Let me pause on that note for just a moment. In just a couple of days is pagan Halloween. Some wishy-washy compromising churches that don't want to get too close to the devil, but they don't want to get too close to the Reformation either, will be celebrating what they think is a neutral harvest festival with trunk or treat. They don't want to offend anybody. They are lukewarm bilge water that Jesus will spew out of his mouth. It's serious business. Those little compromises are the things that ultimately bring total destruction and defilement to the church. The Reformation needs to happen all over again, even though we may pride ourselves as being the sons and daughters of the Protestant Reformation. The point of this Reformation Sunday message is that there are patterns in the history of God's people that tend to get repeated because the devil, our adversary, and the adversary of our souls knows what works and it's worked for him over and over and over again since the creation of the world. We've just read about it in detail from the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. But throughout history, there has been a need for reformation. He took a stand. He could have lost his life as a result of his stand. That's the crying need for today. The wretched pattern of compromise in the church had happened over the filthy centuries as the Roman Catholic harlot collected her own unflushed sewage and force-fed it to people who no longer could read the Bible in their own language. Exactly the same thing happened to God's people in the Old Testament. We've been studying Exodus in our morning worship services. God started Israel off on a solid footing when they left Egypt. God showed his incredible supernatural power in the plagues. God showed how he could kill their enemies in the crossing of the Red Sea. God showed how he could protect his people and stand between them and the enemy. God gave them the law. It was perfect. It was quite capable of being a righteous national standard, not just a personal standard. God showed how he could provide for his people with daily manna and water and how he even kept their shoes from wearing out. But even when they were in the wilderness and almost immediately after leaving Egypt, while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, the people impatiently decided they didn't want to wait for God any longer. And so we have the fiasco of the golden calf. Are you that kind of person who's impatient with God? You don't want to wait to see what God will do, but you plow ahead with your own agenda. This kind of rebellion didn't happen just once in 40 years of wandering. It happened 10 times. 
It's the same thing that we see through church history. Over and over. In other words, on average, it happened once every four years. That's a pretty short memory for people who could see the Shekinah glory cloud resting on the tabernacle every day. But God had not left himself without a witness. Periodically, he sent his prophets to bring them back, to call them to repentance and faith, even as he faithfully sends his preachers of the gospel the faithful preaching of the gospel. That's what we've just heard magnificent messages on this past week. Oh, you should have been here. But most people don't want to hear the faithful messengers of God. Israel all over again. God sent his prophets to bring them back, to call them to repentance and faith. Jeremiah makes a special point of this, which is repeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all the way through the book of Jeremiah. I'm just going to read you scattered verses. Jeremiah 7, 25, 26, 29, 35, 44. Let me just read you a few of these verses. Since the days your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, So he begins with the exodus. I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Chapter 25, the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. Chapter 26, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Remember, the people rose up early to worship the golden calf. That excited them. They got up early for that. God says, you like to get up early? Okay, I'll get my prophets up early and send them to you so that they'll be there when you show up. Because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I send unto them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but ye would not hear, saith the Lord. Chapter 35, I have sent unto you all my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them. God's not you know, too slow for you, saying, return ye now, every man from his evil way, amend your doings, do not after the other gods to serve them, you shall dwell in the land which I have given unto you and to your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Chapter 44, howbeit I send unto you all my servants the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate, how many people are going to celebrate Halloween? Do not disobey the thing that I hate. Read the insert in your bulletin. The Bible verses that I've put down there for you. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, not to celebrate them. Jesus says in Matthew 23, verses 34 and 37, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, That's what we just read all about in Jeremiah. It's all over the Old Testament. I just just picked a few out of Jeremiah. And wise men and scribes, and some of them, ah, here's what you do with them. You don't like their message? Some of them you shall kill and crucify. And some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. We don't like preachers like that. The faithful preacher of the gospel preaches that, whether you like it or not. Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. God sent them. They stoned them. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. That is a deliberate, premeditated choice of rebellion. In the same way, God did not leave his people without a witness as the centuries built up to the breaking point of the Protestant Reformation. He sent Jan Hus of Bohemia, who was burned at the stake for challenging the filthy wickedness of the Roman Catholic harlot. I do not call it a church, but a whore, the very whore of Babylon spoken of in the book of Revelation. He sent John Wycliffe and his Lollard preachers who translated the Bible into the English language. Even though the whore couldn't kill him in his time, they later dug up his bones and burned them and threw them into the river Swift. God sent William Tyndale, who again translated the Bible into English. 
Rome sent spies who found him, captured him, and then with a mockery of a trial strangled him and burned him at the stake. His dying words were, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. And just a few years later, God did just that. Have you read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Last year, I gave copies of it to all of my children for Christmas. That's a Christmas present. Dear people, I weep over you. Do you not know your heritage? And because it is your heritage, the fact is that now you are called to step into the front line of battle. Because the battle is raging and it will soon be at this church. Are you totally insensitive to what's happening in society around you? Do you read the inserts that I put into your bulletins every week so that you will be informed? Or do you merely say, oh, let somebody else take care of that? Do you shrink from the shrews of your ancestors who fought this bloody war to give you your religious freedom today? Do you not understand what is happening in this land as the sodomites, the transvestites, the sexual orientation gender identity perverts, the child molesters who are twisting the minds of children who want to have sex changes with injected hormones and surgery, and those who want to stop the mouths of preachers like me and put us in prison or even put us to death? Don't you see the parallel with the passages that we just read? Do you not know that even though Jack Phillips won his case at the Supreme Court back in July, don't you know that even though he won that, he was the baker, you know, I hope you know this, who refused to make a wedding cake to celebrate the so-called marriage of two homosexuals, he was fined and harassed and dragged to court because he stood for Christian principles. Do you not know that he has been sued again over the same issue? He's been sued again! The perverts know that they will lose, but they are determined to harass him to death. By the way, Jack has also refused to bake cakes for Halloween parties as well. He's consistent in his stand on the word of God. Do you know about Baronella Stutzman, who refused to make flower arrangements to celebrate a homosexual wedding because she is a Christian? Do you understand how if these people lose their cases, not only will they lose their cases and their businesses, but you will not have the right to stand upon any Christian principles in any occupation, and this includes all of you. Do you understand that in just about 10 days, a national election will take place that will determine whether you continue to have freedom of religion to practice your Biblical faith. Oh, other religionists will be able to practice their faith. But you will not be allowed to practice your biblical faith if certain people get elected in this upcoming election. Keith mentioned it a few minutes ago. All 435 members of the House of Representatives have to stand for re-election, and in some cases they're not running, and so we have two unknowns. Where do they and their parties stand? Do you know anything about them? Do you know anything about even one candidate? Suppose in this election, it all went Democrat. One-third of the Senate, which has a very slim conservative majority right now, one third of the Senate will be elected and you will be, not possibly, you will be affected by whichever direction that goes. Because the president offers candidates for all the federal courts, most importantly the Supreme Court, and they have to be confirmed by the Senate. 
you will be affected by how this election turns out in just about 10 days. If you're 18 or older, you should be registered to vote. I mean that. If you're 18 or older, you should be registered to vote and you should vote. I personally firmly believe that refusal to register or refusal to vote is a sin against God's people and the church. Are you registered? Are you going to disturb your complacency for just a few minutes to go down and vote for righteousness? Some of you have been registered for a number of years, but you sort of ho-hum during midterm elections and don't bother. Some of you even missed the national election. Don't count on somebody else. The buck stops at your desk. You need to be there on Tuesday next. Are you going to vote? I pray that God will judge you if you don't. Where does it begin? It started with little compromising sex sins with David and Solomon, which ended up with the pagan wives of Solomon, turning his heart from the Lord God, and it resulted in the murder of his own children to pagan gods in child sacrifice and participation in witchcraft. People, we have that today, the horror of abortion and the insane, filthy, eating stupidity of so-called Christians who celebrate Halloween and use the devil's music in their make-believe churches as they wiggle their half-naked bodies under the strobe lights. Don't you understand that empty-headed, so-called Protestant fools are getting together with the Roman whore to remember the Reformation as just a minor set of differences? But now that Protestants can get back in bed with the decadent, venereal, disease-riddled prostitute, they have fun again! I hope you read, every time it comes out, the Redeeming the Time magazine published by our presbytery. The issue that you've got here, the brand new issue that you've got here, is the 40th edition of that. It's been 10 years, comes out four times a year. This is the 10th year celebration of Redeeming the Times. Someday, that kind of magazine will no longer be allowed to be published. And you'll say, boy, I wish I'd have read those articles back then. I wish I'd have known what was going on. That keeps you up to date, folks. From our perspective, Bible-believing Protestants, do you read it every time it comes out? Did you read the cover article by Brad Zell entitled False Light After 500 Years? Pick up the most recent copy on all the church literature tables today. Do you know that the World Communion of so-called Reformed Churches and the Lutheran World Federation, as well as others, have decided to sign up for a turn in bed with the whore? Time would fail us to cover all the literal physical wars between the harlot Rome and Bible-believing Christians and how Rome pursued them with a vengeance to many parts of the world where they tried to escape. Some of the great reformers, such as Ulrich Zwingli, died on the battlefield defending the faith once delivered to the saints. Hitler himself, a Roman Catholic, signed a concordat with the Pope and ended up killing not only six million Jews but an equal number of Christians, the most famous of whom is probably a Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, though we certainly would not agree with his neo-Orthodox theology. History repeats itself with shocking regularity. With all of this history and with the prophecies of Revelation about the great horse still in existence during the Great Tribulation, still killing believers, we are tempted to despair. But there is still great hope for us. God sent repeated prophets, rising early and sending my servants, the prophets, throughout the Old Testament to call his people back. God sent repeated courageous men throughout the centuries as Rome declined so that God might call his people back. 
Did you listen as I read the passages about King Hezekiah? The compromise had started with one of his ancestors, the great King David. They were multiplied by his son, the wise King Solomon. They overwhelmed both Israel and Judah after Rehoboam split the kingdom. But God had not abandoned his people. God raised up Hezekiah when he was still a young man. He was 25 when he took the throne. And he reigned for 29 years. God give intense blessing when there was a king who said, I don't care what everybody's done before me. I'm going to get rid of all the groves. I'm going to smash all the idols. Even the brazen serpent, which we would look at and say, man, we wish we had that in the museum. He called it Nehushtan, means a worthless thing. And he broke it up because the people were starting to offer incense to a brass snake. Hezekiah says, followed the Lord his God with all his heart, as had done David his father. That means his ancestor. Hezekiah broke off the yoke of the king of Assyria. Hezekiah took a stand for righteousness. It was going to cost him something. Sennacherib invaded. Sennacherib took Assyria. He sent Rav Shaka down to Libna. He sent him to Jerusalem. And Rav Shaka stood outside. And here are the Jews all on the walls. And Hezekiah sent a message, tell him, you know, not to talk in the language of the Jews because we can understand his language. He said, no, I'm going to talk in the language of the Jews so that all the men who are standing on the wall will know that someday they're going to have to eat their own defecation and urine. And he says, where are all these other gods? They didn't defend their cities. And your God can't defend your city either. I'm going to come in, I'm going to kill all of you, and I'm going to take the, all the women captives, I'm going to drag them back to Assyria and scatter them around different places, and you guys are going to be in trouble. Isaiah the prophet was alive at the time. And Hezekiah sent to Isaiah the prophet. And he said, you know, it doesn't bother me what he says about us, but it really does trouble me what he said about God because he's committed blasphemy. Would you please pray to God that he would defend his own name? Did you know you can always pray that prayer and get a yes answer to it? Don't worry about what your situation is. Hezekiah knew that if they came in and captured him, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill all the people that had stood against him. But Hezekiah was concerned for the name of the Lord. Do you understand that's the heart of Reformation? Do you understand that when you stand on God's side, even if they kill you, you are invincible because God always wins. God has never lost a battle. He's taken some soldiers to glory, but he has never lost a battle. And he is our God. God raised up Hezekiah when he was still a young man. Some of you are young. Some of you are older. Some are middle-aged. God can do incredible things with one person. I hope you know that. One man had started the process of falling into the decadence and decay, David himself. That increased with Solomon and the kings in both halves of the kingdom after him. But God used one man to turn the tide, just as he did with Luther. God uses people. But they have to have courage. They need to be willing to risk their own lives. They may live, they may die, but they are committed to standing and saying, Thus saith the Lord. God called Esther to the kingdom for such a time as this. God used tiny little Paul to go through incredible suffering. God called Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Hebrew names, to go through the fire. But Christ was with them. God called Daniel to the lion's den where the angel of the Lord shut their mouths. 
God used one man and one woman to reverse the tide against overwhelming odds. Do you ever pray that God will use you to stand against the apostasy of the day? I hope so. The Reformation was a return to the Bible which declared that the just shall live by faith. By faith alone! It's one of the great five sorrows of the Reformation. We're not only made alive by faith, but faith is what controls our daily walk. The just shall live by faith. Faith produces good works, but it always precedes them. The good works are always done in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the power of the flesh. They are always to the glory of God. They are in obedience to the word of God. And works that are not done by faith are not good works if they have some other standard instead of faith. God has before ordained those works that we should walk in them. Any man who claims that he has faith but has no good works, characterized by the divine requirements, proves that he is not saved. The man that claims to have faith but never results in a changed life proves that he is a fraud, a professor, not a possessor. Now, look, let's apply it. What have we just been talking about? There are a couple of simple ones coming up in the next couple of weeks. What are you going to do in relation to Halloween? Are you going to be here with God's people celebrating the Reformation? Or are you going to be passing out trick-or-treater candies? Or, shudder even worse, dressing up and going out yourself? More money is spent by adults on Halloween costumes than they spend for children. We're going to have the opportunity to vote. Faith without works is... You don't vote, you will suffer. This is a critical juncture in the history of the United States of America. We need to make sure that there's not rebellious sin in our life. Reformed by God is the title of this message. We see that with Hezekiah. God reformed Hezekiah's life and Hezekiah reformed the nation even though it could have cost him his life. Reformed by God can be summarized by two key ideas. Repentance and return. What we need to do is repent of our corporate sins of compromise and together return to the Bible. That means return to the doctrine and the practice of the apostles. And the understanding of the reformers was this. That means being faithful unto death. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. Oh, rising early and sending unto them your servants, the the prophets. And throughout church history, you've been rising early and sending unto them your servants, the faithful preachers who were faithful unto death. And we are their heirs. And now it is our turn to take up the sword and the shield to stand against the enemy and to advance against the foe who is coming in like a flood. And to be faithful 
even if it means to be faithful unto death. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 16, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's stand to sing all the verses. Hymn number 16.